everyone, welcome to another episode of Content and Conversation. Today, I'm excited to have Tom Critchlow uh, on board to talk through uh, his new amazing SEO MBA course. Uh, people don't know this about Tom necessarily, but Tom actually has done some consulting for Siege, is an amazing independent consultant, has a great background at Distilled and Google as well. So excited to talk through um, his, his new course. Uh, so welcome, Tom. Thanks, Ross. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, uh, as as uh, I think I've mentioned in other places, but I have a ton of respect for your kind of SEO and obviously in this context, business mind and finding that intersection of not just like technical SEO recommendations, but uh, actually knowing how to get things done. That's clearly something that's valued. And, and with for people who are not aware of your new course, there's a lot of uh, excitement and uh, initial traction for it, I think, for a lot of those reasons. Yeah, I've had a, had a bunch of bunch of good feedback from the first couple of weeks of launch, so uh, it's really encouraging so far. Nice. Yeah, I mean, one of the first things I thought of with that course and kind of what you're going through there that I think could be tangible and useful for people, given you've been in the weeds, is there an example you could give us in terms of a situation you've actually secured a significant amount of SEO budget? And like, what was the tactical breakdown of how you went about doing that? Yeah, sure. I can give you an example from from a couple of years ago, working with a large, uh, large Fortune 500 client to kind of build out their SEO program. And, you know, I should caveat this by saying that I was bought in by the CEO who was kind of primed for change, which I think is, um, you know, a lot of consulting stories start with a big success, but they they you have a kind of easy layup intro, right? It's like you're not just starting from a cold start, but actually the CEO or the VP or the CMO is bringing you in to like drive change because they're ready for it, which I think is a critical moment in time. But, um, you know, I got brought in to, to kind of overhaul the SEO program and went from a team of three SEOs to a team of about uh, 10 SEO professionals. But more than that, um, kind of structured this multi-million dollar investment in SEO across product, editorial, and the SEO team. So, um, you know, I think what's interesting about that, that project and how it framed a lot of my thinking was it was one of those aha moments where, it's like SEO requires resources from other teams. And that's kind of like a no-brainer. Like, obviously, SEO requires resources from other teams, right? You need product, you need editorial. But actually, in this case, we were spending the majority of the budget, the majority of the budget I was asking this client to put into the SEO program was outside the SEO team, right? So like, yes, we're growing headcount in the SEO team. Yes, we're expanding that that remit. But most of the efforts are on front-end engineering, uh, design, product, and editorial, right? You know, we've got like a 17-person editorial team that we're building and an eight-person SEO team, right? So um, that disconnect, I think, is is fundamentally why I think things like consulting skills are useful, right? It's because SEO is, even even in a, an organization that isn't silo, it isn't cross-functional, um, SEO is a cross-functional uh, discipline, right? You have to be good at getting other teams to spend their resources on your initiatives. Um, that's like a fundamental frame. Uh, and so that's why I think SEO requires some of these soft skills. So in the project that I worked on, it basically went from, okay, what is the big objective? What are we trying to do? Uh, uh, give like not only a kind of business value, so uh, projecting out the revenue forecast over one and two years, but also positioning it in the way that the CEO cares about. Right. So in this in this example, uh, the company I'm working with had one very clear competitor that they were always benchmarking themselves against. And we basically positioned this as, OK, there's a revenue opportunity by investing in SEO, but there's also a way to close the gap with our, with our big competitor. And that was the kind of the language and the framing that really resonated at the executive layer. And then that trickled down to, OK, so we're going to invest, you know, X millions of dollars into building out editorial product and SEO um, as a kind of a, a package. And, you know, what was interesting about that also was we didn't actually get into the weeds too much, right? We had some example projects that the product team was going to work on, some example projects the editorial team was going to work on, an example uh, kind of products, uh, projects and resources that the SEO team was going to drive. But we weren't actually in the weeds, right? We were justifying those as kind of like, these are example projects or the kinds of things that we're going to invest in to, to prove that the revenue potential is there. But most of the framing was at that high level around, if you're going to spend X millions of dollars, we need to have an understanding of where that's going to go. But we also have to embrace the fact that building out these new teams, hiring new resources is going to, is going to you know, necessarily like, you know, reality is going to meet our strategy and we're going to have to adapt and, and you know, uh, change as we go. So um, that was a really fun project and shaped a lot of my own thinking about putting an investment case together at that level, you know, thinking about an SEO program in the order of millions of dollars. Um, and yeah, it was fun. Nice. Yeah, I love that uh, insight of like framing SEO is not just 
SEO manager on staff. I think so many people, when you when we have conversations, we're like, how big is the SEO team? And most often you get the answer of, eh, it's just one or two people, but really right. so many people touching that. If you can kind of think less selfishly maybe <laughs> about that uh, in a way, it's probably more success for you as an SEO, right? Right. Yeah, I have a kind of slightly contrarian take. I think a lot of people in the SEO industry think that companies don't invest enough behind SEO. And actually what they're not investing enough behind is front end design and products, right? Like, like the, the front end oh, HTML yeah. of their website is where they're under investing. So they have a product team and the portion of that product team that's actually working on the front end of the website is usually pretty small, right? Like you ship a new website and then it just like stays there. Right. Um, but actually that's the piece that is under invested in relative to SEO. Like, yes, sure. It's, you know, as SEOs, we're always keen to get another SEO manager or another SEO director or an ad and SEO agency. Um, you need some of the SEO strategy and some of the brains, sure. But actually the doing work is where you get most of the results. And that doing work happens in the product team and the editorial teams for the most part, right? Occasionally you'll find an SEO team that's kind of self-contained, right? They have their own product resources and their own content resources. But m much more common, I would say, is that the SEO team, like you said, is like one or two people kind of dangling off the side in the org chart while it's the product and, and uh, <laughs> the content people that are really driving the actual results. Um, and, and the SEO is just kind of like setting the direction and vision, doing some strategy, uh, et cetera. That was actually going to be my next question is like what that what you think the recommended org chart structure looks like. Is it that where it's dangling off to the side or is it something different? Yeah, it's a good. Great, great question. I think SEO manager. Yeah, yeah. It, I, I think it depends a lot on the business model. So it depends a lot on, you know, is content strategically important to the organization? Is that kind of a core competency? Or is content really directly in service of SEO, right? Like if content is only in service of SEO, then often it can make, make sense to put content underneath the SEO team or inside the SEO team. If editorial and content is kind of a, a, a thing the organization does and is like, you know, well scaled, then it often makes sense that the editorial team and content team, you know, separate, right? They have their own goals above and beyond just SEO. They're either driving social or uh, selling advertising against it, whatever it might be. Um, in the same way, it depends how important SEO is to the product team, right? So I see sometimes SEO is like a small kind of team sitting inside the product team. Sometimes SEO can be like an SEO director dangling kind of off the org chart, but with a dedicated like growth product team or, or, or kind of um, uh, even an SEO product team, if SEO is strategically important enough to the organization. But again, I think a lot of it comes back to, to deciding on, you know, is the tail wagging the dog from an SEO perspective, right? So like, is, is, is the front end of the website primarily for SEO or is it primarily for something else? And that'll change where you put SEO inside the org chart as to how strategically important it is, okay. whether SEO is like an input into other considerations or whether SEO is actually like driving, driving the, driving the car. You know what I mean? That makes sense. So one, one of the other things, uh, bubbles you gave me off what you mentioned is talking about or, or questions I had was how you're thinking about ROI. So you mentioned getting a lot of money, are you like looking at Ahrefs, merging analytics data to create some model? Are you creating a model in that context? Or what did that look like to have confidence that you're going to say, this is going to make you blank money off of it? Right. Yeah. So, so um, there's kind of two ways to do uh, revenue forecasts or kind of create an investment model for SEO. Um, and you kind of need both of them. So, so on the one hand, you have like a bottom up analysis, which I, I think is more of like, what do we have today and what is expanding that look like? So let's say we have a thousand pages. What happens if we create a hundred more pages or what if we create 20% more pages, right? And you can model out the impact of that from a kind of a, a pretty basic model. If we know how much uh, traffic and revenue we get per page today, if we expand our number of pages, we can reasonably assume, you know, this growth and so on. Um, and the bottom up analysis is really useful because it's very credible. Right. So it's very believable for the organization because we know we're starting from concrete numbers. We're starting from what we have. We're starting from modeling out, you know, either click through rates or conversion rates that we know today, right, that are true from existing pages. Um, and so, so a bottom up analysis is really useful. But the problem with a bottom up analysis is it's often quite small. It's constrained by kind of believability, right? It's hard to say we have a thousand pages today. What if we had a million pages? Right. And suddenly that math starts to break down, right? People are like, yeah, that's that's a bit of a stretch. Um, uh, you know, going from a thousand to a million, um, can we really do that? You, you know, uh, uh, your credibility goes down. So you also need uh, what I think of as like a top down analysis, right? So the bottom up analysis is starting from what we have. Top down is looking at some kind of reasonable total, total addressable market, right? And that, this is often in the sense of a competitor. So you say, okay, um, for example, a good, a good content is a good example. We don't create content today. I think we should have a content strategy to start creating content. 
I think the opportunity for us to do that in year one is, you know, this, it's not huge, but we're going to get started. We're going to make a hundred pieces of content, et cetera. But the total addressable market for that content, look at this competitor. They've been doing it for five years. They get, you know, 2 million visits a year from their content. So we're not promising 2 million visits a year in year one, right? But that's the goal. That's what we're trying to get towards, right? And so what, you, what you're looking for there is basically something that ex executive level, level of the organization gets them excited that this is kind of a big strategic initiative. Even if we're not going to get those results on day one or in the first six months or in the first year, it's worth doing. Because not only are we going to get some results, we're also shooting towards something which is ultimately meaningful and big uh, and, and aspirational, right? Um, and and I think that's often what's missing as SEO professionals in particular. We love looking in the weeds, right? We we can pull a CSV export for any kind of data set you want, right? Like we we're we're very um, <laughs> we're very well versed in trying to trying to extrapolate from what we have, looking at the data, looking at the analytics, and so on. And sometimes I think we forget that most business strategies are based on on only a small number a small small number of pieces of information right you're either looking at one big competitor or one big strategy and you're saying i think <laughs> i think this is good i think it's a big idea i think we should do it um and and we sometimes shoot ourselves in the foot by coming with too much data right and we're too much in the weeds of what exists today that we forget that we can just kind of paint this bigger picture for for executives and is that in the context, uh, I mean, that's a good segue to strategy presentations and what the mistakes you see there. Is that is that one of them? We'd love to hear uh, other, if any, mistakes you see in those presentations to executives. Yeah, I mean, there's a, a number. I mean, I could no doubt about presentations for, for hours. I love making decks. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I think there's a number of different uh, mistake, types of mistakes you can make. The most fundamental of which is not talking about revenue or at least business value, right? So like leads or revenue or whatever that like proxy for revenue is, we've got to get to that rather than talking about SEO metrics. If you get all the way up to the CEO of an organization, you're talking about traffic, they don't care, right? Like they might they might kind of care, or they might think they care, but like they don't really care. Um, uh, we have to make really care about it by talking about business value, right? Revenue, leads, et cetera. <clears throat> and then we have to position that on an annual basis. So a lot of the times I see SEOs um, come with kind of a, a reasonably well thought out pitch but we're framing it around like monthly traffic numbers and monthly revenue. And it just makes our whole idea seem small. And we can seem so much more impactful by positioning this as in year one, we're going to get this. In year two, we're going to get this, right? Those numbers start to get much bigger. They start to look more enticing and more exciting. And on the one hand, this is a total like trip. We're just times our numbers by 12. But on the other hand, it actually <laughs> it actually more closely aligns the like the time frame of both investment and returns, right? We like we know SEO doesn't happen overnight. Right. So um, you've all seen those charts like we invested in content and content and content is going, it's going, it's going. And it starts to kind of hockey stick, right? Starts to take off. Um, we want to we want to accurately create the mental model for executives that this is the kind of initiative we're investing in. We're not investing in paid media, but we turn it on and on, turn, turn it on and off. Right. What we're doing is we're investing in a, in a thing which has a long time time frame, long term uh, returns, but also compounding interest. Right. Like it's this idea that, yes, you make content and you don't have to update it all the time. Right. We're updating it what, every six months, every year, every two years, depending on industry um, that. So so by positioning our revenue opportunity as annual, it actually more closely aligns the truth of like this is the time scale on which we're going to get returns. So um, positioning everything as revenue, putting it on annual terms. That's kind of one of the biggest mistakes I see. The second mistake I see is just not making it uh, compelling to the executive team. Right. So so trying to position our SEO strategy as full of kind of tweaks and optimizations and maintenance on existing platforms rather than something which is active and, and kind of growth oriented. Right. So a lot of times we'll try and ask for budget to fix things or to optimize things. And honestly, you know, I, I wish it wasn't the case, but that language just doesn't really fly at the executive level. Right. Like like investing large, large sums of money into like a strategic initiative they want growth, right? They want um, they want something which is more active. So I like to frame it, even if we're looking at maintenance and paying, ta paying down tech debt and optimization, framing that as a way of like, well, we're going to have a new team or new processes or new investment, new content, trying to, trying to position this as something which is active and growing rather than just, you know, like moving deck chairs in the Titanic and, and like optimizing what we already have. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting, th that is definitely something we, lean into and then we've re realized as i think the industry has kind of realized as that it's things mature is like we need to do be doing more updates to keep this content and maintaining it it's a difficult balance where sometimes uh, we like go into renewal and i almost like talking to the team about strategy there in some ways i'm like 
we should almost lower our growth total, but that feels weird to do. It should be more on updates. Any anything you would do different, or like maybe it's like you're into an engagement, maybe it doesn't matter as much. Well, I, I mean, in, your, in in the agency example, I just add it in, right? I'd be like, well, we're in year two now, so we got we made twenty pieces of content in year one. We're going to make twenty pieces of content in year two, but we're also going to go back and update all the ones we did in year year one. So like year two is going to cost you more money because we have to do more, right? Um, like I wouldn't shy away from the fact that okay. if, so, if something has value, right? Like, uh, you know, again, why should we assume that? we have to fit it into the same budget we had last year, right? Um, you know, if something's valuable, it's worth doing. If it's worth doing, it's worth spending money on investing, like doing properly, right? Investing resources against it. Um, but again, it's about that sense of, it isn't just about optimizing and maintaining year one, but about actively creating a new process around updating content, right? So it's like, like again, the, the, the mind frame of maintenance and updates and optimization just doesn't really, it's not very appealing to anyone to have to like maintain things, but treating it as a growth lever to be like, we're going to create a new process and a new team about updating our old content. We're going to update every single piece every three months or six months. Like that's a new activity. It's going to drive new growth. That's going to look like, like you can just frame it in a more positive <laughs> sense. Right. And then it, honestly, this sounds like kind of stupid semantics, but, but the, the way that we position the strategy is really important that it goes all the way up to the top of the organization where can a CEO get excited about it? Right. That's that's ultimately the question that we're asking all the time. It's just can we get somebody who's senior inside the organization to A understand the initiative? So it has to be simple enough and clear enough. And B, can they get excited about it? Um, you know, those are kind of two, two, two big fights we have to win. Love that. Yeah. With it's something we're probably not doing well enough in terms of that up communicating the value of updating that old content. It makes total sense um, to upsell there. One of the things you specifically helped us about that I should share is back on that annual basis recommendation you just gave. That's something that was, I feel like has been powerful for us where we're communicating the ROI based on that 12 months. So we'll go out 12 months and then say, if you stopped working with us uh, in 12 months from now and just did that, our incremental monthly traffic value times 12, this is what you would see. And that was based on your recommendation. And it feels like that's been very strong. Great. One of the things you made me think about with that is a question is like, would you even frame the, we're going to, we're going to add, let's say hypothetical, we're going to add 200,000 in monthly traffic value at the end of the 12 months. Should I even have that? I, I'm going to guess you're going to say yes, but that number in there at the end of 12 months, or should I just be giving that yearly number? You talked about yearly numbers. Well, uh, I mean, it, 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 it depends on who you're presenting to, right? And what level of fidelity and detail you're, you're aiming for. I, I would always try and give the yearly number first. So position the, the, the number that people that like sticks in their head is the annual value or the annual return. And then we can, we can come back to like, you know, what that means is by the end of 12 months, we'll be at this, you know, monthly, uh, monthly volume or whatever. But um, I just feel like positioning it annually is both a bigger number, but it also, it gets people thinking in the right mindset. It's like the mind, right mind frame of investment to, to not be just month to month, right? Um, yeah, that's, that makes sense. Smart. So uh, another thing I saw on your website, and um, I'm particularly interested in is how you're thinking about modeling link building ROI. So you, I'm sure you have clients or have had clients who do this, or you're talking to SEOs that think about this. How, how do you model that today? or suggest people model it? It's a great question. Um, and there isn't like a like a, a single answer or a single kind of easy answer to this. Um, it's kind of link building is classically hard to hard to measure, or at least hard hard to connect to revenue, right? In particular, it's kind of a, a roll up function. Um, there's a number of different ways that I've seen it done. Uh, on the one hand, you can kind of look at this from if we assume that SEO traffic is important, and SEO traffic is worth x the organization, and we assume that link building is a crucial part of that. Then we can we can quantify the value of links by estimating them against some other kind of benchmark. And often this is against what would it cost us to get links if we hired an agency, right? So so this is like an in-house time, right? You're like internal link building team at an organization, and you say we're getting you know 100 links a month. Um, if we were to go and hire go and hire Siege, for example, they could get us links at an all-in rate of like 1,200 bucks a link. Let's say we're getting a hundred links, so we can we can we can justify the value of our work by timesing each link by its kind of fair market value, right? Like if we we're going to go out into the open market and hire an agency to go do content marketing for us. All in, they'd be getting links at this rate, so we can value them at this rate, right? So like that's the value of our work. On the one hand, that's good because uh, it gives you a dollar value. On the other hand, 
it's pretty far disconnected from like reality, right? You're kind of like, it's it, you're like several orders away from actual revenue impact that somebody can believe. Um, better than that is if you can actually get some, uh, or, or to complement that even, right? You can, you can do a blend of these, is to look at an actual situation. So looking at, hey, in this category, we did link building and before and after the traffic or revenue was this, right? So you can say, here's a particular set of pages or a particular category that we're trying to promote. We got 15 links. Those 15 links drove this much traffic improvement. That led to this much revenue improvement. Therefore, these 15 links help contribute to that revenue uplift, right? And so then you can kind of work backwards to, therefore, we're going to assume each link is roughly this value, right? Um, so again, you, that, okay. what, the benefits of that is like, it has some actuals behind it, right? Somebody somebody can be like, wait, how did you calculate each link? It's like, well, when we did this, you know, we got 15 links and we got this much revenue. Therefore, we're going to divide that revenue by 15, right? And that's the value of a link. Uh, again, it's not like, accurate, right? And it, it covers up a whole bunch of ways in which you could go out and get but low quality links and they could not be worth anything or, or you know, but um, <laughs> uh, the value, the, the point here is, and I'll, I, I emphasize this a lot, uh, both in, in the course, but also just generally when I'm when I'm working with agencies and in-house folks is when you're modeling any kind of SEO, what you're looking for is explainability, not truth. So you're not looking for hmm. science. You're not looking for you know, we did a big causation correlation analysis and we did like this big spreadsheet and we get grabbed APIs from over here and we found that the value of the link is, you know, 17 bucks and 55 cents. Um, now, while that kind of work is intellectually satisfying and I've done it too, right? I love knitting out spreadsheets. While that work is intellectually satisfying and while that work um, can be more, quote unquote, more accurate, if you can't explain it easily to an executive, it's worthless, right? They're not going to believe it. They're just going to be like, you did some spreadsheet thing, whatever, and you come up with 17 bucks. Yeah, fine. But I don't really believe it. I don't really understand it. I haven't internalized that value. So what you really need to get to is you need to drive to some some estimation of value, which is explainable and has a simple rationale behind it, which is why I like things like either fair market value or looking at a specific category. Um, those kind of things are, are just like the, the, the kind of thing that you can explain to a CEO. In, in, in a few minutes, right? Like it doesn't take a big, long uh, um, explanation. And that explainability has a ton of weight when it, again, when it comes to that executive layer in particular, like they need to, they, they feel the need to actually understand everything. But if it's too complicated, they just, they just struggle to see all the details. That makes sense. One of the um, interesting, both your models make sense, complete sense to me. It's interesting to hear the contrast of how we think about it. We're uh, I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but for the outside audience, we're current currently what we look at is traffic value divided by number of links to that overall site. And then that gives you a monthly link value. Yep. You multiply that by 24 to give it a lifetime link value. Of course, there's so much other things that go into that, to your point. Uh, I don't know if that's already too complicated. We do occasionally get questions. It's not occasional. It's not, it's probably more than occasional of like, what, how did you come to this? Uh, that sounds great. I mean, what I like about it is you can just explain it, right? And 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 so the good thing yeah, here is that easy. Yeah, um, yeah. What I like about this, and, and I think this is a key point, also, uh, especially for agencies, is you don't have to be act, you don't have to be a hundred percent right on the first try, right? But it's still better to have a revenue number than to not have a revenue number, right? Instead of saying, well, I don't know how we should measure the value of links, I'm just going to talk about links and traffic. Instead, you should be, well, I'm going to create a value per link. And then I'm going to talk about that with a client. I'm going to discuss it. Right? And if they want something more accurate or if they feel like that's <laughs> discounted for some reason, then fine, we'll update the model, right? And we'll go back and we'll say it's not 700 bucks a link, it's actually 950 or it's not 700, it's actually 400 or whatever. But like, actually, that's a really valuable conversation. And, and um, there's a critical moment in every agency relationship when you can move from, uh, we have a kind of abstract notion of tying traffic or links to revenue so we have a formally agreed upon metric. And so it's a critical moment where it's like beforehand, we're kind of like estimating and kind of operating in, in this gray area. And then you do some work, you present some stuff, you agree with the client. You know what? From now on, we're going to agree that every organic SEO uh, visitor is worth this much re revenue or every lead is worth this much revenue or every link is worth this much revenue. And then you could just use it, right? Once you've agreed upon it, like the, the key thing is not to make it right, but to make it agreed upon, right? That's the, that's the light bulb moment is then once you have it agreed <laughs> upon, then you can actually use it, right? Then you can start to say, okay, now we have this new project. Should we invest in it or should we not? Well, we can size it up by using our revenue calculation and we can say it's going to be worth this much value to the business, right? And that's all we care about. All we care about is getting to a, um, 
getting to a to a, a useful tool, right? We're trying to get to this revenue calculation as a thing we can use, not a revenue calculation that's like somehow scientifically abstractly correct, right? It's a, it's a it's a strategy tool that we use to say, should we do this project? Yes or no? Um, should we should we invest these re- resources? Yes or no? Right? Should we do this or should we do this? Right? That's that. It's it's an analytic tool. It's not. It doesn't have to be scientifically correct. Um, you know, and so I think that's that's often a light bulb moment again for a lot of SEO folks who are so so deep in the data that they think it should be all about you know find this like absolutely correct value and instead uh, <laughs> uh, uh, when it's business it's like they just want something to agree upon and move on right love that idea of kind of agreeing upon a metric is there kind of like a typical time frame you suggest starting to have that conversation internally is it six 12 months something else I think it depends on how how many other variables are changing in the organization, right? Like, let's say that we're starting with building on day one, and then six months in, we feel like we have a ton more information, a ton more data. We can go back and revisit it. Uh, again, maybe we start out by valuing the uh, each link on a kind of like industry, industry agreed kind of uh, comparison, fair market rate. But then after six months, we can start to layer on top our own data and say, actually, we have some case studies now of look at this category where we move the needle, look at this category. Um, I think it's, uh, again, it will depend on the size of the client, like a startup kind of client is going to want to revisit that metric probably more often than an enterprise level client. Again, with an enterprise level client, you can often agree upon a metric and then just keep it for years, right? That just becomes the way that you measure that activity and they don't, they don't really go back and change it <laughs> ever, really. Um, <laughs> uh, so again, I think it's about understanding, having an understanding of how much the client cares how much the client is updating metrics elsewhere in the business and so on. Um, I mean, I think ye- at least yearly, you should you should be trying to reassess, but um, again, kind of taking the lead from the, the client. Smart. So we, we talked earlier, and I think you indirectly walked into this in terms of content marketing and modeling and ROI in terms of bottom up and top up kind of things. Is there anything you'd add to that in terms of how you think about ROI for I mean, it has overlap with link building as well, but just curious if there's anything you'd add there. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it obviously depends on the business, but one of the things that is often missed is valuing the the email signup. So just like we talked about valuing like a per link metric, a lot of organizations will have a per email value. Right? It'll be like every new email is worth $1 to us or $2 to us. Um, and a lot of content marketing is, it's, it's sometimes, but not often the primary metric. But um, it can be a nice value add, right? And uh, there can be occasional pieces where it's like, actually look back on a year, it's like, hey, we drove an extra you know, 5,000 email signups or 20,000 email signups or whatever it might be. Uh, don't forget to just kind of value them in, right? Um, so that can be a kind of nice value add. Um, above and beyond that, again, it's about content marketing and understanding what value does it have for the organization? So what is the search traffic we brought in? What is the links that we brought in? What are the email signups? Like kind of look at the holistic value um, of the stuff that we've done. Uh, and again, you might be able to back into some estimations above and beyond just the pages that were created. But like, let's say you say, hey, we did a um, we did a, a research piece around a credit card category. And when we did that, our, ca- our credit card category, the other pages, like the core content, they rose this much, right? So actually you can start to take credit for some of the, some of the benefits elsewhere on the site from just from the content marketing stuff that you're doing. You know, the more that you do that, the more you start to overreach, right? So you have to kind of like find the find the, the kind of the, the happy medium of like, are we really? Do we feel like it's credible to to present those results as our own, or to take credit for some of those results? Um, but but you know, thinking about it in that way, because what I see again is in the like in the sales pitch and the strategy pitch, we talk about content marketing as having this kind of halo effect, but then when we go to measure it. We are only measuring like the value of links or, or or something, right? So like, I think we should try and we should try and line up the the holistic value that we talk about at the strategy level with the actual measurement side, what we can to try and to try and bundle in all of the benefit that we're getting. Yeah, it's smart. And to your point, making sure you don't overreach on things. Like we've we've we do that halo effect for sure. And then sometimes I worry we will we'll do that model and the link value won't be very high. But then I know if we got links directly to that credit card page, it'd be much higher, but it's kind of hard to quantify that sometimes. So right. um it's kind of interesting to hear you talk through that. I love that per email sign up idea as well. Is there uh, any kind of like on securing budget conversation, which you seem to you're definitely an expert on? Like, are there any non obvious tips that you'd recommend for people in terms of navigating that and, and getting things done there? Non obvious. I mean, I guess so. Probably my my the thing that is most often missed that I think is really important is. 
uh, making sure that we have we have like a strategy pitch, which is kind of internally consistent, right? We're trying to say we want these resources to get this revenue potential, right? We have an opportunity and a project that we want to work on, and it kind of furthers our goals and our aims. Um, but we always have to make sure that we're positioning that inside what the rest of the organization actually cares about, right? So, so I talked about in this uh, one of my recent SEO MBA emails, uh, talking about Etsy in particular, right? And um, when you look at Etsy's quarterly earning reports, you can kind of get a sense of like, what are the three to five things that Etsy cares about at the very highest level, right? The things that they're talking about in the quarterly earning report as being kind of strategically important. And it's not SEO, right? It's like they're talking about the growth of video listings on individual products, because that's a new feature they just enabled. They're talking about international expansion, and they're talking about um, getting better on-site search, right? So there's like three big initiatives that they're investing into from, uh, and that they're, those are big enough and interesting enough they're telling Wall Street about them in a quarterly earnings report. Now, if you're an, you're an SEO professional inside Etsy, you want to do something which has nothing to do with video, nothing to do with international, and nothing to do with on-site search, but you still have to position it inside one of those frames or relate it to one of those frames, right? So let's say that we want to fix a bunch of technical issues on the site, right? We should make sure to note as part of our strategy presentation what the impact of those fixes is going to be on the international sites, even though the international sites on their own might only be a tiny sliver of traffic, right? Where, what we're doing is we're basically positioning our strategy. So we're saying, look, we want to do this thing. We think it's net revenue positive. And like the cherry on top is that it's also going to meet this thing, that you, the, the, like one of the top three initiatives of the organization, which is inter international expansion, right? And there's kind of two ways to think about that. One is you can kind of just sprinkle on a little bit of relevance. So you can be like, by the way, this initiative does help that thing you care about. Or you can actually just choose a different strategy, right? This is like the, the, the ultimate kind of goal is actually, what if we just choose a different thing that actually directly helps internationalization or it helps one of these other things that the, the organization cares about. So um, I feel like too often, again, as SEO professionals, we we focus on the things that we want to do and we focus on the things that look like you know technical fixes and technical optimizations. But we forget a little bit that most organizations have three to five priorities. And think anything that isn't one of those priorities is like shut down, you know, underfunded, uh, punted to next year. Right. <laughs> it's like and 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 that's okay, right? That's like if you if you if you've been in the room with like a like a, a um, you know senior levels of organization, you'll notice how hard it is to get an organization to do something new, right? They're just constantly like saying, "No, I don't want to do anything else except this thing that is really important to me strategically," and so they're really focused on saying no to things, right? They're really trying to say no to everything that isn't one of these top three to five initiatives because getting those those big initiatives done is hard enough on its own, right? They're trying to focus, right? And a lot of a lot of CEOs in particular will treat their job as my job is to help the company focus. My job is to help the company focus on these three things. And so if you're not one of those three things, or if you look like you're not one of those three things, you're going to have a much harder time getting budget and buy-in than if you align yourself to what the organization cares about. And again, that can be kind of a big thing, like you're, you're choosing a different strategy, or it could just be kind of cheating. Like I said, it's like, hey, we want to do this thing anyway, but I'm going to frame it as supporting one of these pillars. So I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm positioning myself as like a team player. I'm, I'm on board with the top three initiatives of the organization. And I'm positioning it as this thing that I want to get budget for <laughs> is going to help us move towards that goal, right? And I think that, um, again, it can seem like cheating or it can seem irrelevant to kind of do that work or position that way. But this is this is literally the difference between a CEO getting excited about something and saying yes, or a CEO being like, eh, this looks like maintenance. or this looks like a distraction. This looks like something that I'm not going to do this year, but I'll do next year, you know, whatever, right? Um, and, and that's crushing, right? When you're when especially when you're doing things like yearly planning, it's like if you don't get the budget this year, you have to wait another year to try and pitch for resources again, right? And, and uh, <laughs> I, I've, I've seen teams that have been in those situations, and they're stuck in this kind of cycle of like, we don't really have any resources to get anything done. And then because of that, the results they can show are quite small, right? And th this is actually a bad, bad, like vicious circle to, to, to get into. Yeah, we we've noticed that for sure in pitches where you have like a our Venn diagram of what we do well and then people want to do. And when we feel like we can't align with that, it just and try to change their mind. It goes poorly 95 percent of the time, right, um, right. unfortunately. Uh, but love that idea of like I actually shared that article with our team internally uh, of kind of thinking strategically and aligning st strategic uh, thought process of the of the company. L I need to be doing that more in sales personally also. So I love that. So that will be an action item to look at, uh, yeah, uh, earnings calls and things like that as we're building proposals. If, if you think that's the right uh, way well, to think well, about it. Well, I was going to say, what, what's interesting about it is when, when, you, when you realize that that's important, and that can be a light bulb moment sometimes when you're in the room and you realize kind of how decision-making goes at the executive level, 
once you realize it's important, it's actually relatively straightforward usually to figure out what a company cares about, right? Whether it's earnings calls or whether it's listening to a quarterly all hands, or in the case of an agency, just asking, right? Like putting it as part of the sales process and the the, um, the kickoff process to be like, well, what, is, what are the top three priorities of the organization right now? Like, what are, what are you doing? What are the big bets? And sometimes you won't be able to get an answer, right? Um, this is another situation is that it sounds nice to have like a, a, a clearly defined, you know, top three initiatives. A lot of organizations are kind of a mess uh, operationally. And so the marketing <laughs> manager or the VP of marketing that you're talking to will be like, I don't know, like the company's doing a bunch of shit. I don't really know what their, what the top three priorities are right now. In which case you have to do more discovery and you have to work a bit harder to try and back into that. But um, where, where you can find it out, you can at least ask the question, right? That's the, that's step one is at least, at least trying to get that answer. Um, you know, another, another good example, especially on the content marketing side, to frame a, a content marketing initiative as something that a company cares about is literally just framing it as we're going to reach this customer segment that you care about, right? So again, one of the big initiatives that a company will often have is we're trying to reach this particular segment, whether it's like an e-commerce, like a, a general e-commerce site, trying to find like uh, wedding people. So like trying to find a wedding niche to grow that, or whether it's like uh, a B2C organization that's trying to go into B2B, or whether it's a B2B company trying to go after enterprise clients. Like there's usually one customer segment, which is either new or um, really important for some reason, right? It's just like, that's a gross lever for the company. And that's one of their initiatives is reaching this new se segment or growing that segment. And so uh, with a content marketing initiative, it can often be strategically important. Again, even if you don't change the strategy that much, just to talk about it and position it as part of the work that we're going to do is we're going to reach enterprise customers because we're going to, we have these ideas or we're going to reach uh, small business customers because we have this content or like you know you can kind of basically pick a sliver of the strategy and elevate that in the narrative right so you're not necessarily changing actually where the investment goes um but you're, you're kind of changing the narrative so that it becomes this thing that you can talk about and that's the thing that will stick in the heads right ceo will be like all oh, right i'm gonna pay that money to siege and they're gonna do that thing that i need doing right um, that's kind of what they'll take away from it. um and sometimes that's all you need for them to be like yeah go ahead um you know rather than having that scrutiny and coming down and being like wait why are we spending all this money with these people again yeah, that makes sense. Uh, completely tied in, and uh, yeah, got my brain going on. We have relationships with 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 different markets and uh, bloggers and reporters that we do we pitch, and we probably should be leveraging it against that exact narrative that you're describing there in terms of accessing new markets for clients. And we never do that. It's always like in a link mindset. Um, but like on that uh, framework of closing budget. And um, that activity, curious if you have a sense for what should people, and it's probably every organization is different, but like say you're asking for SEO as a thing in the industry or I don't know, something in that call, like how long in a company that has a C-suite should you expect a big pitch to take from like uh, creation to you're, you're getting the, the, the access to the funds to spend that? Well, I mean, that's a really wide open question. How long is a piece of string? I would say there's yeah, kind of, yeah. you, what you're what you're waiting for is to find a senior stakeholder who's primed for change. Right. And and again, I talked about at the beginning of the call, right? Like as a consultant, I often come in as like a very luxurious position because there's some executive who's primed for change, who's like asking for help changing, right? And that's like, <laughs> that moment makes everything much easier than you might have if you're like in-house, you've been in the SEO team for five years, and you're trying to change your organization, but you don't have that moment of some of some senior stakeholder who suddenly is like, you know what, we need to reinvent our SEO program, right? Like until you can find that moment, things can take years to get off the ground, right? Things can take a long, long time. Um, but a more practical answer I'd say is find out when the organization does yearly planning and when they do budgeting and forecasting, right? And, and in a startup, for example, that might happen on a quarterly basis, right? They might do a kind of quarterly allocation of resources, quarterly forecasting, quarterly goals. In a big organization, it often happens on a yearly basis. So it's like, okay, we're going to do 2022 planning or 2023 planning, whatever it might be. On a big enterprise client, sometimes it's on a multi-year basis, um, but usually yearly is kind of the, the common frame. And a mistake I see is that, that um, we'll try and make an SEO strategy and we'll do it like out of sync with when the company's doing yearly planning, right? So for whatever reason, we'll have an idea, we'll have an opportunity. Again, the agency will get brought in mid-year, whatever it might be. And we think that that's an opportunity to pitch a strategy. And so we make a big pitch and the organization kind of says no. And we take that as, oh, they don't want to do it. Instead of, oh, well, they haven't got the resources right now. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad idea and they're always going to say no. And so it's really useful to have an appreciation for when those big 
like strategy moments are, when the resource investment moments are, and when it's sensible to come back and say, actually, you know what? I want two more headcount on my team and I want an extra 25K a month for a content marketing agency. And you can do that in a, in a yearly planning frame, right? When people are kind of primed for that, you can't do that out of sync, right? When you're doing that in the middle of the year, everyone's like, no, the headcount is fixed. I can't get you more headcount. What like are you doing? 25K a month, like that's crazy. That's a huge <laughs> budget, right? Like, and yet yearly planning, often that's exactly the right time when you should be doing those things. So having an appreciation for when organizations kind of ready for change and when they're not, um, to, to answer your question more specifically, after a long ramble, um, when I get brought into an organization, I usually <laughs> I like, think it's like, good like, like, I would say like four to six weeks is, is typically what I'm looking at from like initial kind of kickoff of, of, of project to mm. I have some kind of like defined kind of pitch and strategy that's put together. Now, it can be much longer than that if we have to do a lot more discovery, right? There's a lot more of like, actually, we need to figure out what the answer is first. When I come into an organization, often the answer is kind of relatively straightforward. And it's more about just putting it into a tight frame, finding the right uh, resource figures. So it's like, okay, we know we need an SEO team, but how big that should that team be? We know we need to do content and editorial, but how big should that be? What or what level of investment should that be? So um, usually what I'm coming into an organization is to kind of pull a narrative wrapper around it and give it some cohesive kind of structure more than like first principles analysis of like, I need to go and like do the work, do an SEO audit, et cetera, et cetera. The other thing I'll say, just one more point on that is I, the way that I work is very iterative. So, uh, so when I create like a big strategy pitch, like we're talking about, um, yes, the output of that is usually a presentation, right? It's usually quite a long presentation. It has a kind of, you know, executive summary at the front, but then it has a lot of detail in it. Um, but it isn't the first time anyone's seen it at four to six weeks, right? I'll, I'll, I'll usually try and create a sketch of it very, very quickly. So, so, um, you know, again, when you've been around a while and, and, you know, I think a lot of folks will resonate with this is, you know, what the answer is kind of on day one. Right, like you and I can look at a website or look at a business, talk to somebody in house, and then be like, okay, well, I'm pretty. It's pretty obvious what the answer is. You need some content over here. You need to improve your your core pages, or you need to invest in making these pages better, or you need links, or right, whatever. Like, there's kind of a small number of levers you can really pull, and the answer is, is fairly straightforward. Um, and and so <laughs> so what you want to do is you want to is you want to tease that as quickly as possible, right? To say, I think what the opportunity is is this. And then what we have to spend most of our time doing is quantifying the resource ask, right? So it's not enough to say we should do link building or we should make these pages better, right? That's kind of like the surface layer. What we need is we should make these pages better by expanding the front end product team or by pulling in an external development agency or by hiring 15 content writers or like, it's like you need that concreteness, right? That depth of, of actual thinking to be like, I've done the work and I've figured out what it's going to cost. Right. So like sizing the opportunity and knowing what to do is kind of the easy bit. Right. It's like sizing the actual investment and making that investment tangible and concrete. That's usually where the hard work is. Right. And so it's going from we should. Right. Which is kind of like we should do this thing. So, OK, fine. But like, what does that actually mean? Right? <laughs> Who's going to do it? Right. With what resources and how much is it going to cost? And that's when you start to get critical feedback, um, especially on the kind of agency relationship right? agency client relationship is going from, oh, we should make our product pages better, which is like with our expertise, right, with, like, with our strategy hat on, we identify that as an opportunity. But if they can't devote any product resources to those product pages, then that shouldn't be a part of our strategy, right? Or we need to figure out how to get it done with an external yeah. vendor or something else. Like, like, like we have to find another way of doing it or we have to abandon it. Like there's no point in having this part of our strategy, which is improving the product pages, if there's no resource, resource to get it done. So what I spend a lot of my time doing is going from that like abstract high level we should, which is like where the opportunities lie and what you know, me with my expert hat on and, and actually quantifying those opportunities down into like, these are the resources we actually need, right? And that's when you can start to talk to an executive team um, more confidently because now you actually have a plan, right? It isn't just presenting the opportunity, but it's actually, this is the plan to get it done. And it's credible because I've spoken to the various stakeholders. You know, we've already pre-agreed it, right? So that's another piece here is like, um, if the whole pitch takes four to six weeks to put together, people are seeing it at week one, week two, week three, right? Like I'm going to let the chief product officer and going to the chief, chief marketing officer, right? And getting those inputs, right? From the critical pieces along the way. Um, so that by the time it gets to the CEO, it's pretty well battle tested, right? This isn't like a big reveal. It's not a big surprise where I'm like, you know, with like a cloth over my strategy, <laughs> like, -da! like uh, and everyone's like, ooh, and ah, and it's like, terribly wrong in it. Something's gone terribly wrong. If this is the first time people are seeing yeah. it, something's gone yeah. terribly yeah. wrong because that, and, and that's when you fall flat on your face, right? right? That, that's when you start to, the CEO is like, what the hell is this? 
what is this? This is nonsense, but we haven't got a development team. The product teams are building the app for the next 12 months. Like, what, what are you trying to get me to do, right? And that's when you lose credibility, right? Um, and, and it's such a painful moment to, to be in that situation, watching a team create what is otherwise a kind of a good strategy, like it's a good idea, but they lose credibility by not coming with a kind of practical application of like, this is a concrete plan for getting it done. Um, and that's actually like when you start to lose estimation in, in the, the executive team's eyes. And I just, you know, that's like a really bad situation to be in. Yeah, uh, yeah, all, all, all great tips. And one of the things you made me think of was like, one of the primary parts of LinkedIn sales navigator is around organization change. So if someone just took a new job or yeah, that's effectively it. It triggers agencies to pitch people. We don't actually use it, but I see the values like the time to get something done right. is when someone starts a new job and they could be that new shiny thing. And even if you're an internal, I don't know if you disagree with this, Tom, like if they did hire a new director of marketing, if you're internal, that could be a good point to like bring an idea to that person and be like, we've wanted to get this done. Maybe they hear it from you. We might actually get it done this time. Totally. Yeah. Or yeah something totally. like that. And that's also, you know, um, the, another failure mode, both for agencies and for in-house folks is when somebody new comes along. So it's like a new trigger point, whether it's like, oh, we're doing yearly planning or whether it's like there's a new director of marketing just started in the role at that trigger point, you want to be talking about business and market opportunities, not like a laundry list of technical tech items to fix, right? It's like, again, I see like a lot of in-house SEO teams maintain this list of things they want to get done. And that's fine. Like, you know, it's like the technical debt, these things are uh, valuable and they're probably going to, you know, actually show results. But the new CMO or the new director of marketing, you know, starts on the job, goes to speak to the SEO team and is like, okay, high level, what are you working on? What are you doing? And they get back this like laundry list of tech items. And they're just like, oh, the SEO team is like deep in the weeds, right? They're not strategically important, right? Like that's, that's what they, that's the perception that you get. Instead, you want to use those opportunities to start at the right level of abstraction, right? So you start by talking about the market opportunity and then you eventually get to the tech details, right? But you start by being like, well, SEO accounts for 50% of revenue. We want to do these big initiatives and we need a new front end team. Now, we're not going to get that until we get to yearly planning at the end of the year. But in the meantime, we have some tech things that will actually move the needle, right? So it's kind of like you start at the right level of abstraction of, of like value and strategy. And then you kind of go, you peel the layers of the onion to get down to the details. But when you start with the details, again, you lose credibility, right? Because the, the new executive or the, the CEO, or whoever it is, is like, oh, we're straight away talking about the nerdy details. This team is probably like buried far down the org chart and not that strategically important. Right. When you start the conversation talking about this is the big target market, this is the big revenue opportunity, <laughs> it, fra it just frames it differently, right? And again, this stuff is going to sound ridiculous. It sounds like it sounds like I think often when I talk about this stuff to folks that this is very much soft skills and that it's somehow like secondary to all the other things you work on. But this is how you get things up. This is how you get budget and buy-in to work on the things you want to work on. And like, there's nothing more important than actually getting things done, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. I, I'm hearing growth and excitement is kind of like a common narrative of things you should be bringing to people uh, rather than the maintenance and all of those things that um, you spoke to and definitely agree with all those things. And and speaking to that and like maybe we've done a model uh, and we're, we've implemented a plan. I don't know if you've also seen instances. And I think this would be kind of the cautionary thing, which I'm sure you're helping with people, helping people with in your course is the nervousness of, did I model that correctly? Like I, we look back and we were wildly off by 50%. And to your point, like you don't get this perfect, but have you seen the instances or experiences in doing that wrong that people could learn from or there'd be any tips towards? Yeah, I think there's, um, I think the, the biggest mistake is people expect to be right. Right. Again, this goes back to the, the idea I talked about before of like people want to be right rather than using something which is just useful. And um, models and forecasts are just analytic tools, right? They're just things that they're estimations that we made that that are useful to be able to assign resources. Very few times is anybody right, right? And it's like this is also true on the product side, right? Like so, for example, you know, SEOs are often in, in this, the situation where they're like SEO results. It depends, right? Um, but that's true of marketing results <laughs> and product results as well, right? Like you see a product team pitching for like a big replatforming of a website and they'll position it as like, this is going to improve average order value by this much and going to improve load times by this much. And it's like, they make these big projections. 
never works out that way, right? Like we never get exactly what we thought we were going to get, but it's a useful <laughs> analytical frame to be able to make a decision. That's all a forecast and a, and a model is, right? And so I always like to think about forecast and model as, as opportunities to say, okay, we go back, we look at where we, the actuals, we look at our model, and we try and close the gap with learnings. Right. So, so the worst, the worst situation we can be in is to say, this was our model. This is where we ended up. And we don't really know why. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Like, um, you know, we yeah. kind of made this, we, we made a model and it was wrong. That's not a very positive. <laughs> Instead, <laughs> we made a model and it was wrong because, right, is a much more powerful message. And this goes back to how the model and the forecast should be based on, on explainable assumptions. Right. So again, we don't want this big causation correlation analysis. We don't want to pick hefty like a spreadsheet. We want to make it so that we can explain our rationale to an executive. And when we do that, we're limiting the number of factors it depends on. So then when we go, when we come back and we revisit it, we can say, well, we, uh, our assumption didn't pan out because we'd modeled the investment on, you know, 300 links per article. We ended up getting 200. And we ended up getting 200 because of, we didn't end up getting the PR investment we needed or, you know, competitors were more active or you know, whatever, whatever reason, right? But like, you look at the metric that we thought we were going to get and we didn't get it, we can explain why. Um, or we say, uh, you know, we thought results were going to be this. We didn't actuals work with, with this, um, but we now know that we have a much more, we have a much better understanding of how many links we can get per article. Right? We made our last forecast. We never done it before. Now we've been doing it six months, and we can reevaluate the forecast because we have actuals. So let us go back to the model and put actuals in. Right? Again, it isn't about failure and blame. Right? Um, oftentimes, right? Even though it can feel that way, it can feel like I was wrong <laughs> and my my job's on the line. And Sure, sometimes that is the case, but far more often is that it isn't about blame and it isn't about like um, you're doing bad work. It's just about, well, hey, we made some assumptions. Those assumptions were off for whatever reason, and we're going to make some new assumptions, right? We have more learnings. We've gained learnings. We've gained education, right? And I think that's the most important part. Um, again, I've been in interesting situations where, you know, we've done like a, I think in particular, one example with a client a couple of years ago where I was helping them build a content marketing like discipline. So they'd never done content marketing and they were like building a team internally to do content marketing. I was helping them kind of get the team off the ground. And we made some campaigns and the campaigns, you know, we thought we had some kind of benchmarks of like, well, we think good looks like X number of links. Um, and we were way off. We ended up getting not nearly as many links as we thought we were going to get, right? And I think mostly this is attributable to the fact that it was a brand new team doing this. It was a something we'd never done before. We didn't have the experience and the like the flywheel behind us, right? It's like doing a new thing is always hard. And so when we presented those results back up to the executive team, we were like, listen, we thought we were going to get this number of links. We got, you know, uh, a far smaller number. Um, but the executive team was like super jazzed because all they saw was that we'd gone from zero to something, right? They were like, well, you, pre you presented a metric <laughs> yeah, that you were yeah. excited about hitting before. And we were like, okay, great, run with it. But we uh, understand that this is a brand new thing and we understand it's going to take time. Um, and so like the fact that we've gone from nothing to proving that we can do it, it's live and it got some links is like a big win, right? And, you know, I will also caveat that by the fact that like there was some other like softer benefits, like the sales team had found a lot of value in it and pitching, pitching um, sales wins on the other side of the business. So there was other stuff that was like harder to quantify, but was kind of good signals the CEO was getting back. So it was kind of this halo effect that we talked about, right? Of like all in, I think this is worth doing. Um, now, I don't think you can get away with that forever, right? I think we have to come back to the table with another forecast yeah. <laughs> that's more realistic and we have to show results in the future. But it's just an example of where you can be sat in a job or sat in a role thinking that you've done a really bad job when actually the reality is like different than that. Right. And, and again, it's about trying to have that kind of unemotional um, reaction and trying instead to be like, well, listen, all kinds of business decisions are based on estimations. Uh, estimations were wrong for a variety of reasons. We have some new learnings. Therefore, the next six months, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, I, I, I found this when I was working at Distilled kind of early in my career. I feel like this is a, a big learning was just how much that kind of clear communication with the client can keep a project going and keep investment going above and beyond actual results, right? Just like clearly communicating, clearly explaining, being transparent, right? Trying to find a way forward. Like all of those things are like super valuable it, completely independently of how much success the yeah, client is getting, yeah. right? We, we have a company value that's impressed with communication for like very, for a very similar reason. I feel like you just gotta, you know, we, like if we tell, we have a bad outcome or we think we're gonna have one, communicating that in front of it. Right. And to your point, I think it makes such a massive difference of mm -hmm. stickiness and not. Uh, one um, question I had off when you're thinking about modeling 
for SEOs in particular, I don't know if you have a specific number you look for in terms of like the investment is X and then we expect to get Y out in terms of like, do we need to be confident it's going to be 500% ROI? Like I know there's a lot of uncertainty with SEO where the obviously the bigger that number is, the better. But I don't know if there's like it happens in our pitches where we, we do that modeling and it doesn't work. And then we right. have to pull it. And that's we have a certain number there that we lean on. But curious if you have your own uh, thought process there at all. Yeah, um, it depends. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I, I was in a situation uh, with, a, with a client uh, was it last year, I think, um, where we put a model, we put one of these models together and we said, you know, we're going to invest this much in SEO it requires hiring an SEO director and you know, spending some external development resource to, to actually work on the initiatives. And because we were hiring an external development team in particular, it was pretty pricey, right? It was kind of like a, a hefty investment. And the return was like, I think we're going to get return from this in year one. Like, I hope that we'll certainly get return in year two. Like, these things should compound. But it's kind of marginal, right? Like, it isn't like a slam dunk. It isn't a, it isn't a home run. Um, but when I got up to the executive team, they looked at it and they were like, well, listen, you know, actually, we're spending, you know, $5 million a year on paid search. And it's basically like marginal like the the we're not really getting any margin from it right it's like break even right so we're, we're acquiring customers just as much as it costs to service them um and that was kind of a light bulb moment for me it was like it really depends on the margin of the other activities the company is working on as depending on what margin they need on this so what return um they need on this seo investment right so it's like that that perspective of like is a company looking for a big margin a big return what are other initiatives they're spending on returning for them right that's kind of the question you need to ask um the second piece of that is um, always making sure that when we're, we're modeling our investment relative to doing nothing, right? So, so again, what I see a lot of mm. a lot of models will look at uh, actuals from this year, right? So we'll be like, well, listen, in 2021 we got this much traffic and revenue, uh, therefore we're going to model the investment case for 2022 and you know project uh, gains. Um, but it isn't a given that 2022 is going to be the same as 2021, and in particular. Do we really believe that results in 2022 are going to be flat if we make no investment, right? Because what we're basically modeling here is if we do no investment, we'll get this. And if we do some investment, we'll get this, right? And so we're kind of modeling the upside, but we don't model the downside, which is actually if we do nothing, things may decline, right? And this is certainly true for anyone that has an existing Probably. decline, right? So often, again, as an agency, you'll often get clients coming to you with declining traffic. Right? This, is like, this is why the hiring agency is to grow, right? And so, so we shouldn't be modeling against a flat traffic line, we should be modeling against the declining traffic line. And suddenly, what might seem like marginal wins actually starts to seem more impressive when we're like, listen, we actually grew against the, against what we forecast as declining traffic, right? If your traffic is already declining 15% month over month or 15% year over year, sorry, 15% month over month would be, would be pretty dire, 15% um, uh, year over year, um, <laughs> uh, then, then, then suddenly our, our wins that were marginal when you model them that way are actually now like quite positive. Um, now, again, some executives are going to throw that out the window. They're going to be like, I don't believe you. You're just trying to make your numbers look good. Um, but I do believe that that is often a a more realistic way to model things out. Um, you know, and especially when it isn't just about kind of making up a decline by kind of saying like, I think you're going to start declining in traffic if you don't do invest. But if there was an actual decline that is pre-existing, then you have a really solid foundation to say, yes, we have a we, we can model against the the decline rather than the baseline. That's smart. That makes me think our numbers are way too high then <laughs> in some of these instances where we're often looking at declines and I'll say to myself, can we undo this or trend line it up? I mean, definitely there's always probably going to be pluses and working with clients that are up trending, but not always is that the case. And there's something right. to that rebound story as well. Um, and, this has and, been great, Tom. And, I think a lot I was going to say, and, yeah, and, and, yeah. and on the situation where a client is growing, you also have to be really wary of claiming all of the upside. Right. This is another like when you know we talk about being credible yeah. with a, with an executive team, right? Sometimes I've I've been in those situations where I'm like, hey, look, traffic grew thirty percent year over year, and they're like, well, it was already growing twenty two percent year over year. So, <laughs> yeah, right. Like you have to be mindful of those things, right? Again, I think all of this is about getting inside the mindset of the executive. Like when you're sat across from them and being like, what are they going to think about? What are they going to care about? How do they look at the business? If you can if you can put yourself in their shoes, then you'll have a much better understanding of how to like position a strategy or an investment case that they care about. Nice. Like that. Yeah. I mean, on, on that note, Tom, your SEO MBA website and content is like some of the only content I need to read now. I feel Thank like you. for many SEOs is for staying up to date for people who have been in it for a while. I think it's just like no brainer 
And I learned a lot on this call in particular. Definitely recommend everybody check out the course, sign up for that. Uh, a lot of good stuff there, no doubt. So uh, on that note, is there anything people can look forward to on SEO MBA? Like what's coming next? To wrap this That's up. a great question. Um, well, uh, firstly, I'd say if you have ideas, email me. Um, I'm always looking for content suggestions for what to write about next. Um, I think I have one on the docket for next week, which is all about advocating for expanding an SEO team. So um, like increasing headcount specifically on the SEO team. That's what I'm going to write about uh, next. So look out for that, um, especially relevant for in-house teams, I think. Um, but again, if you have suggestions, shoot me a note. I'm pretty active on Twitter as well. So um, always, always looking to kind of write stuff that people actually want to read. So shoot me a note. Nice. Yeah, well, uh, by the time this publishes, that should hopefully be live. So no pressure to do yeah, that no right pressure. now. You have to <laughs> yeah, get published. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this has been great, Tom. Definitely follow Tom on Twitter. Subscribe to the to the Substack. Uh, it's great. And I take the course and appreciate you coming on, Tom. Thanks for the time, Ross. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm.